Hi, I'm Daniela Cambone, and welcome back to our summer series here on StansberryInvestor.com. And do I have a guest for you today? He is the president and CEO of the Lindsay Group. He's also the former director of the National Economic Council under George W. Bush. And he joins me today with his latest book, Currency War. Please welcome to the show, Larry Lindsay. Uh, Larry, uh, so nice uh, to finally have a chance to speak with you. Welcome to uh, StansberryInvestor.com. Thank you, Danny. It's great to be here. Well, I read with great interest your book, and I have to echo uh, the words that Mike Pompeo said about it. I kept wondering, um, you know, where the fiction ended and re reality began. So for the folks back at home, in a nutshell, the book talks about the trials of a banker trying to stop the CCP, uh, China Communist Party, from making the yuan, the reserve currency, overtaking the U.S. So... My question to you, Larry, is could this become a reality for you? Is this something that keeps you up at night? Uh, well, there's lots of things going on in the world to keep me up at night, so I don't want to separate this one out. But there's no question that, uh, first, uh, part of Xi Jinping's plan is to replace the United States as the world's only superpower. And part of that plan will be to have the yuan replace the US dollar. The move on the currency is probably um, going to be earlier in his campaign because if he can succeed in that, the US, given our current you know, deficits and what have you, is going to have a lot of trouble financing its debt. So definitely replacing the dollar is one of his objectives. It's almost a, a juxtaposition to what we're seeing happening with the tech crackdown that they're doing. How can they win the war as a superpower while at the same time they're cracking down on their tech titans? So what's more important here, control or being the superpower? Uh, well, Xi Jinping sees them as two sides of the same coin. Uh, if you read his speech to the uh, Chinese Communist Party on its 100th anniversary of its founding, uh, you'll see that um, control by the Chinese Communist Party is goal number one. And then he goes on to explain how the Chinese Communist Party is making China uh, number one in the world. Uh, he talks about um, having China basically get revenge for all the humiliation it suffered at the hands of the West. So there's no question in that speech that that is his goal, and he sees control as the way to do it. What China's really sacrificing here is um, the prosperity of its citizens. That used to be objective one. Now, no, that's not on the list. It's sort of mentioned as, oh, that'd be nice. But that is not the goal. It's control and then have China be number one in the world. I've read uh, past interviews where you've said that, uh, you know, with the extremely uh, easy money policy we have in place, this really poses a risk to the Fed, um, you know, and, and could possibly erode confidence in, in the central bank. And that's, you know, would only play into favor uh, for China here. Can you elaborate on, on what you mean there? Sure. Well, one of the key themes uh, in the book is that the key to any currency is credibility. And right now, the dollar is a perfectly credible currency. Um, however, uh, that isn't necessarily always going to be the case. Um, in the late 1970s, for example, things got so bad for financing of the US Treasury and for the US dollar, that we actually started to issue debt in foreign currency terms, for example, in Deutschmark terms, in order to take advantage of lower interest rates. The markets were selling off both the dollar and the bond at the same time. If we get in that kind of situation, things are going to get very rough. Back then, no one really thought the Deutschmark was going to completely replace the dollar. But now, given an economy the size of China, that is a possibility. So once markets sense that the US is simply gonna let inflation rip, 
um, then I think we're going to have credibility issues. Let me ask you, Larry, uh, I just find your views fascinating just because you've been in government so long, uh, just a little bit more on the Fed here. Um, are they totally backed up into a corner here? What should they be doing? Huh. Oh, what should they be doing? Well, um, <laughs> my, my job is to, to talk about what they will do. That's what my clients pay me for. Um, what should they do? Well, it's, it's a little bit late in the game already. The cat is out of the bag. Uh, inflation is headed our way. Stopping the inflation is going to be very painful. Um, it's going to be painful in the same way as stopping the inflation of the late 70s was very painful. The, the only way you can slow inflation down is to have interest rates be positive in real terms, i.e. have interest rates higher than the rate of inflation. Well, we're now running four to 5% inflation. It was over six in the first half of the year. And we've got the Fed funds rate virtually at zero. So that's a lot of heavy lifting before we're gonna be able to control inflation. I can understand why the Fed is now nervous about doing that. Um, it's got another reason to be nervous. Given the size of the deficits, somebody's got to buy all those bonds. And there just isn't enough private saving in America to buy them. So the Fed is forced, really, to step in and uh, buy a significant portion of what the Treasury issues. Uh, in the first six months of this year, the Treasury bought essentially 100% of all Treasury debt issuance. Um, the Treasury was running down its checking account, basically. That was uh, part of the way it financed. And the Fed bought the rest. Well, the checking account is now down to about as low as it can get. So we're going to have to be testing very, very soon just how much the market is going to demand in order to be compensated for inflation. And that in turn is going to test the Fed. You know, I've had experts on both sides of the fence here, you know, people telling me the Fed will never be able to raise rates or you know, it's coming sooner than we think. I mean, we're, we're, how do you think that plays out? I think that um, at least for the next few months, for the rest of this year and probably into next year, the Fed is going to drag it out as long as it possibly can. Um, the reason is, is, is essentially political. The Fed isn't necessarily a partisan outfit, but it is created by the Congress and therefore must, um, in the long run, uh, uh, fulfill the will of our elected leaders. And, you know, as viewers, uh, ask yourself the question, would you rather have a deep recession or would you rather put up with five or six percent inflation for a while? Right now, people would rather have the inflation. That's what the Fed's got to deliver. Now, there will come a point where the inflation will accelerate and accelerate and accelerate. And at that point, I think the public may change its mind. It's changed its mind in the 1980 election. Um, and there will come an election sometime later this decade where that is going to be the key issue. Really well said, Larry. And just to get back uh, to the title of your book, Currency War, um, and if we are in a full-fledged one, and if China definitely has the U.S. in their radar, as you suggest, is the current administration doing enough right now? I don't think that uh, China uh, is at the top of their list of concerns. Um, I think they have a domestic agenda uh, that is their prime objective. Um, that agenda is an expensive agenda. There's no question about it. That's leading to a lot of debt creation. And in turn, that's leading to a lot of money creation. So no, I don't think um, uh, China is at the top of its concerns. It's also a little bit confused about what to do about it. You know, it's remarkable. If you look at the last election, right. I don't know, there were 15 debates among the Democrats, something like that. 
China came up at exactly one of those debates, and it only really came up in one of the three debates that uh, President Biden had against uh, President Trump. The administration never really developed a China strategy during the election process. So it's kind of entering on the fly. And what it did at first was say, well, gee, what are we gonna do? I know, let's just do what Trump did for a while. Well, the world is evolving. Uh, China has gotten remarkably more aggressive. And so um, doing what Trump did just isn't gonna be enough. If I, if I could just mention one particular problem. The, um, right after the election, uh, the Chinese media did its quote analysis of what had just happened. And they were full of praise for President-elect Biden. They said things like uh, he was professional and um, predictable professional and predictable. Well, okay, that means that he's unlikely to rock the boat. Now, Donald Trump, no one could say that about Donald Trump. And one of the things that uh, Xi Jinping was worried about is that if he took too aggressive an action, he really didn't know how Trump was gonna respond. And as a result, he was a little bit more risk averse. Now he knows very well that Biden isn't going to overdo it in a response. And so he has become remarkably more aggressive, more aggressive in Hong Kong, more aggressive cracking down at tech, more aggressive at, um, at cracking down on um, their private educational industry, which was largely tutoring. He is going to continue along that process because he isn't worried about a U.S. response. Let me ask you this, uh, Larry, in, in regards to a currency war, does does the the landscape or what a currency war look like change now with the coming of all the central bank digital currencies or talk of central bank digital currencies? Well, you know, that's interesting. I, I started the book a while ago before digital currency was really <laughs> a, a hot topic. Right. And so I went to what I would call the old uh, standby, which was gold as kind of the basis for uh, what happened in the book. In the end, I don't think digital currency is going to be the key. Um, the reason is the purpose of the Chinese issuing a digital currency, again, is control. They want to know what all their citizens are doing. They want to monitor every purchase that goes on in China. They've already stopped the uh, mining process, mining of Bitcoin, for example. They don't want people to use Bitcoin. Yeah, you have the ability maybe after the fact to track things, but if people are using your own digital currency, you could track it in real time. So that is the Chinese purpose. Um, I really don't see that as gaining a significant foothold as far as people who want to use the yuan. Who wants to share your transactions with the Chinese Communist Party, right? Not a good thing to do. So um, I don't think in the end that's going to help them. I think they're going to have the yuan look like a more stable currency, a less inflationary currency than the dollar. And that will be their pitch that they will be using uh, to advance the yuan. You, you know, you mentioned gold, Larry. So I have to ask you, since it's the 50th anniversary that we've been off the gold standard now, do you think the economy um, would have performed better had we stayed on a gold standard or under the fiat regime that we have? Well, so I have to I have to confess, I was a member of the Federal Reserve Board for five years, a little over five years, five and a half years. Um, and as a result, I am a great believer in paper money, or at least I have to pretend to be. There is a dungeon deep in the 
bowels of uh, the Fed building on Constitution Avenue with the rack and everything, where if you're an apostate, they'll bring you to convince you of the error of your ways. Just kidding. But it is just not, you know, I, I, and it's also what I believe. I think gold has advantages. I think a gold standard, though, can be too rigid. What we need is something a little bit more rigid than what we have, which is uh, human created money, politically determined money, um, and something that's as rigid as gold. And the answer is to have the humans do it, but have them be a lot more prudent than they have been. Larry, are you suggesting that the Fed really does hate gold? I don't know any company on earth that loves its competition. I mean, that isn't what you do. And gold is a way of voting no against the dollar. And so, um, no, they don't like gold very much right. at all. Now, remember, it, we made it illegal. It wasn't legal for Americans to own gold until Jerry Ford came to office. Um, so that is kind of the, um, that's a long held instinct. Um, I would say gold is tolerated, it's out there, but no, nobody likes a competitor. Fascinating insights right there, folks. I appreciate that. Larry, um, I guess just to, just to conclude, again, it's a fictional book, right? But how afraid is Larry Lindsay or fearful of China winning a potential currency war here? Oh, well, on the path we're now on, um, I am not optimistic. I do think we have to change course. I do think we're going to be challenged and not just on the currency front. Um, you have to remember Xi Jinping is different than his immediate predecessors. They were primarily focused on um, improving the living standards mm -hmm. of the people in China. Xi is Mr. Power. And he really is a, a complete sociopath. Um, it springs from an experience in his youth. Uh, he grew up, um, was a young teenager uh, during the Cultural Revolution. Um, his father was a target. So little Xi took a pillow and a blanket and moved to a cave where he lived with his pillow and his blanket all alone for about 18 months, scavenging for food every night. If anything's gonna make you a sociopath, that's going to do it. And he also found religion in the cave. A lot of people in isolation do. His religion was Confucianism and his interpretation was that he is destined to lead China back to greatness. So we really have a, um, I was gonna use the phrase sick puppy um, in charge of the place. Um, that's probably unfair. It's, he's probably rational in, from his own point of view, but he's just not good for planet earth. Uh, and he's certainly not good uh, for America, for the cause of liberty or anything like that. And that is what we're up against. I'm thoroughly enjoying this conversation. Uh, my last question to you, Larry, is the inspiration for your book. What inspired you? <laughs> well, you know, I've, I had written um, six nonfiction books and um, I, um, I decided to just give it, give it a try. Uh, one can always say things in fiction uh, that one cannot say in a nonfiction book. Um, I don't know, maybe, uh, maybe you, uh, you may be too young, but uh, back in the day, we used to read uh, Jonathan Swift's Gulliver's Travels. Well, that was a, really a political documentary is what he was writing. And uh, he was pretty blunt about it, um, about what was going on. But, you know, he was able to escape the, the wrath of the government at the time by making it fiction. Um, and what I've just written is a work of fiction. Uh, any resemblance of characters in the book to anyone um, uh, actually living is uh, purely coincidental. 
And I can say that, and uh, that saves me a lot of uh, grief and headaches. I'm, I'm not expecting to have any book sales in China. I'm sure they won't let the book in, <laughs> but um, yeah. it's much better to, uh, to do it in a fictional uh, way. Well, Larry, I wish you tremendous success with the book. And if anyone watching is interested in getting a copy, I urge you to read it, to get it at currencywarbook.com. Larry, thank you so much. Come back thank anytime you. to stansberryinvestor.com. My pleasure, Danielle. Thank you for having me. And thank you all for watching. We'll have much more for you. So be sure to stay tuned to stansberryinvestor.com. In the meantime, remember to sign up for our free premier content at daniellacomboni.com. That's it for me. Thanks for watching.